So moving on now to talk about uh, really design and silver design in the arts and crafts movement. This section is going to focus on the 1890s. I'm going to talk about the really authentic silver of this period and really demonstrate how rare it is, but how a few innovators, including Ashby and the Keswick School, which I've just mentioned, really made a difference to what we now think of as arts and crafts silver, the majority of which is post 1890s and 1900. So to focus on that, let's just touch on what do we mean by arts and crafts silver um, and what are the key design elements of that. Uh, and I've laid them out here on the left hand side. And uh, I think this is very familiar to many of you. It will, it's all about the hand hammering and the exposed rivets. And in many cases, the non-traditional -con construction or naive construction of pieces. And that's really because it was so important to reflect the handmade nature of the piece those three things. From a design point of view, um, repousse and engraving were very current, again drawing from historical themes often, stones in enamel, still showing that medieval tradition, uh, and I'm really there referring to the 1890s as well as the 1900s. Later on, and I'm going to come on to this, you definitely get the Japanese and Art Nouveau influence, and a smaller sides, many pieces, especially in this early 1890s, are not hallmarked. Um, the makers hadn't either assayed, uh, registered their mark with the assay office uh, or, or simply um, for reasons of, I think, financial, uh, financial reasons chose not to, to hallmark. So just to show you, you can see uh, there, uh, uh, that's the lid, that picture is the base of a lid, which I think demonstrates what I mean by naive and non-traditional construction. So here is a lid of an early Ashby Guild of Handicraft piece. Um, Firstly, just to touch on the enamel, the enameling is incredibly crude. It's paper thin enamel. They hadn't learned yet how to do really good enamel that came later. Interestingly, the finale is not badly made because Ashby did employ jewelers quite early on to help him around 1893. Uh, but the silver itself, you can see hand hammered around the edge there. But when you turn it over, you can see the, you can see that lid. And I don't know how well you can see it, but you've got this, uh, enamel plaque is fitted not just by um, uh, by these silver uh, edges which are holding it in but they've gone to the trouble which makes no sense at all of actually tying in in a fence with silver knots and, and solder uh, the plaque by attaching small hooks to it uh, so a kind of crazy piece at one level but showing where the guild uh, was at in terms of its construction in 1893. So let's just talk about the timeline um, of silver. And what you'll see is that in the 1880s, just focusing on those first three buckets, you had a build up to the silver of the period and um, very little was produced, but you had uh, Dando Sedding. I won't talk much about him, but he was one of the later Gothic ar architects, uh, very innovative. And in his office, he spawned clearly other creative, productive, uh, members like Henry Wilson, who went on to be extremely important in the movement and to do very important arts and crafts, silver and jewellery. You had the McMurdo Century Guild of Artists, which was really the first or one of the first guilds and therefore laid the foundation for what was to follow. But interestingly, they did almost no silver. In fact, I think they did no silver. And then you have something called the Home Arts and Industries Association, which was um, very much set up along the themes that Ashby uh, then copied or, or borrowed from. And this was an umbrella organization to really sponsor and encourage local, um, local workshops, shall we say, local art schools around the country, like Keswick, uh, like what was initially the School of the Guild of Handicraft, and to set up, uh, help set those up to create this education of art and industry, this marriage of art and industry. Uh, and then you start to get in the 1880s, late 1880s, the spawning of what became the uh, basis for arts and crafts silver. So you have in 1888, uh, very importantly, the first really uh, house to do silver was the Keswick School of Industrial Art. Then you get Ashby's Guild of Handicraft, uh, who were making silver certainly around 1893, maybe a little bit earlier. You have something called Connells of Cheapside, who were a retailer, but they were clearly a sponsor of much arts and crafts silver, a lot of it coming from the, the local city, Finsbury Technical College, which would have been near their retail outlet. You have Alexander Fisher, who, who was the enamelist of the period, the great enamelist, Gilbert Marks, the great Repousse, work, uh, Repousse silversmith, 
Then you get the Birmingham Guild of Handicraft, very much in the spirit of the um, Ashby's Guild of Handicraft, but in Birmingham, of course, not London. Nelson and Edith Dawson, and then Oliver Baker. And I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. But whilst I've had to make some exceptions just to contain the lecture, this is sort of it when we talk about 1890s arts and crafts silver. And in their own ways, each of these were pioneers. I'll just say on the bottom there, after 1899, that's when you get this blossoming of the movement and you get the modernity coming in. And I'll talk about that uh, in the next section. But talking to this section, let's start with Keswick. Uh, what are the features of Keswick? Well, it's very early. Uh, 1891 is incredibly early. They have a hallmark, I think, for 1898, uh, 1888, excuse me, 1889. So that's the first real arts and crafts um, assay office hallmark. And this is their silver. You couldn't say there's a lot of modernity in the silver yet, but you could say that it's nothing like normal arts and, excuse me, normal Victorian silver. So it's made a first sort of radical step away from the norm. It hasn't yet reached modernity. Um, and I'll just give you an example, uh, which is the box, the tea caddy you can see there. So this is what it looks like in, um, in I'll say reality, when you handle it, some sense of scale, very unusual uh, repousé design, perhaps borrowing from um, the 17th, 18th century, it's hard to say. And then interestingly, and I don't think you'll be able to see this in the lid, uh, you won't be able to see that in the lid, it reads scratched in um, Robert Temple uh, made me 1891. Um, and that is uh, a lovely touch. And you again, you wouldn't typically see that on any other Victorian silver. That's the ESOF of arts and crafts for you. So that's really Keswick. And it, it was plain. It was simple. It's loved, beautifully made, uh, but no hint of modernity yet. And then you come to 1893, which is really an interesting date. And that is when the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society was. So these ACEs, as I've summarized it, exhibitions were held from, I think, 1888 onwards, about every three years, sometimes more frequently, sometimes less. And they were really a gathering of all the great arts and crafts designers, uh, workers, not just in silver, of course. And um, they exhibited uh, their wares for sale, typically. And it was a major gathering of arts and crafts. And 1893 was seminal because that was really the first time arts and crafts silver was seen. But it's striking how little there was, not how much there was. So on the left hand side of this chart, you can see the catalog page 77A. That was the Ashby silver, the Guild of Handicraft silver. It says different metals. So certainly there was copper in there as well. Uh, and on the right, you see um, uh, different individuals, Catterson Smith being the most notable, noticeable, uh, which was all we think retailed by or sponsored by um, uh, Connell's Cheapside. So this, these materials turn up with the Connell's hallmark from 1893, but they were made by members of the Finsbury Technical College, as best we can tell, uh, where Alexander Fisher was, for example, as an enamelist. So you get that. Now, I'll just pause because not shown here, but in the 1893 cat catalogue, there are a number of essays at the outset, one of which is by a very famous arts and crafts member, W.A.S. Benson. And he writes about the lack of silver within the movement. And it's sort of a call to arms. And he was both right and wrong because that call to arms was then answered right in that catalogue. But it was only a very uh, initial emergent, but critically and critically influential uh, display. So what did that silver look like? Uh, it looked like this. So this is the Guild of Handicrafts early silver. It's innovative. It's uh, innovative for sure. Uh, it's not Victorian in any normal way, but it is still largely historicist. And just to show you now, I showed you the lid earlier, but here is the actual covered cup from which that lid comes. And if you can see, the feet are um, uh, ball and claw, I think as it's called which goes back in eons in time, goes all the way back to China, but came into English furniture. I'm going to say in the 16th century, I'm outside my expertise, but I'll take a stab at that. You see it in Victorian silver, but not like this. Um, and Ashby was really borrowing from all kinds of sources to create what I think would reasonably described as a very weird piece of silver. Not necessarily modern, but certainly different. Um, slightly later, 1896, by which time he'd done his uh, own hallmark, you get these pieces, which are rare, but were very much the staple of the workshop at that time. And these are pierced bowls with an interior design, not an exterior design. Um, 
and they're beautifully done and you see a sort of tree of life pattern so very arts and crafts at one level but also quite borrowed shall we say from charles the first silver uh, english silver but again not yet modern very authentic arts and crafts in their feel so that's the guild of handicraft connell's uh, and i said that connell's was really the retailer so underlying connell's were these other designers like christine connell who was one of the uh, members of the family um, Catterson Smith, who became a very important figure in the arts and crafts movement in his own right. Um, and these are the kinds of pieces they were making. And I think the key point is they were very focused on repousse, uh, beautiful work, again, slightly historicist. I think you can see a sort of, um, again, Charles I type influence from English silver, perhaps on the right, definitely a Japanese influence as well coming in. Um, but what you don't tend to see is uh, 3D design. So they weren't really yet, I would say, accomplished designers in silver. Many were converted artists and they hadn't fully um, uh, developed as designers. And again, no huge sign of moder modernity. And just to give you a sense, this is an 1897 rosewater dish. I should have said in the catalogue I showed earlier, there's an 1893 rosewater dish listed. This may be it, later hallmark, but possibly it's just a later example. For sure, this is what it would have looked like, though. And you can see that they're, they're fantastic pieces of silver, but very much in the arts and crafts feel not yet modern. Then we get the Birmingham Guild of Handicraft around 1890. It was established. Its silver certainly dates to around 1895. And again, it's very, very uh, austere, very much in the William Morris uh, spirit of no ornamentation, very plain. Uh, in that regard, it's getting to be modern, the lack of ornamentation, certainly very not, much not Victorian. Uh, and again, I don't think you'll be able to see this, but if, if you look inside this particular bowl, which is 1898, the one shown, it's actually got along the seam a dovetail, which is not the typical way of making silver. It's not hand raised this, uh, but it, instead of a straight seam, it's got a dovetail seam. And that's almost a throwback to the sense that there's a, a carpenter or, or, or someone trained in that area who's now turned their hand to the metal work, which I, I find very, um, very amusing and enjoyable. So moving on, I'm just pausing. So that is, that is really where things were at at 1895. And then you, you start to get uh, further influences. And the first influence I'm going to talk about is the enamelers. And that came in around 1893, but blossomed from 1896. Alexander Fisher was the enameler in the UK. He was definitely um, very active by 1893, but in the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society catalogue I showed you, he had one enamel and metal piece, to put it in context, which may be this piece on the left, which is a belt. And um, he, though, nevertheless, was enormously influential in introducing enamels to the workshops. Slightly later, around 1896, you get the Dawsons, Nelson and Edith Dawson, uh, Edith being his wife, uh, and she was the enamelized. Now, at the time, uh, as was often the case, the man took the name, took the precedence of the um, workshop, but we now know Edith was the enameler. She was the really great enameler. Uh, the silver is very historicist still, but the enamels came in, and that started to create this excitement, shall we say, in the pieces that we see a little later. The second influence you get is definitely around quality. So Gilbert Lee Marks, um, was a trained silversmith. He wasn't really an arts and crafts, member of the arts and crafts movement. He only displayed one piece ever in 1899 in these arts and crafts exhibitions, but he was an artistic silversmith. He certainly wasn't your normal silversmith. He signed his pieces and he was very influential in as much as he had a number of key articles in the major journals of the day in particular, the studio and the artist, which everybody read, um, if I, everyone in design read. And they would have been influential and the quality I think would have hit home and the distinction of quality versus what was going on in some of the arts and crafts workshops would have hit home and around this time you start to see these workshops raise their game in terms of their quality and Ashby's Guild of Handicraft in particular starts to recruit uh, trained silversmiths, trained jewellers I mentioned before and, and also trained enamelists so the enamels start to get much much better. To give you a sense of Gilbert Marks I'm just lucky enough to have got this which is this fantastic cup, enormous piece, as you can see, and you get a real sense of what Gilbert Marks was capable of 
And this would have seen, be seen by the likes of Ashby, uh, and no doubt the contrast with their own pieces probably um, inspired them to further, to further greater things. If we move on once one more, we move on to Oliver Baker uh, and William Herr Hassler. Uh, now, I think most people's lectures on arts and crafts silver wouldn't have such emphasis on this, uh, but Oliver Baker is very much my first love. I wrote about him, uh, I think, 10 years ago now. Uh, in the Civil Society Journal, and I'll just touch on him. He's important in two ways. Uh, the first is classically around design. So he was another artist who had an epiphany. He knew Hassler, which was the big Birmingham manufacturer, and he started to design these crazy pieces of silver, mainly, I think, based on his um, antiquarian shop, which he ran. And so you get things like these candlesticks, which again, bear no relation to pretty much anything else you'll see, but I think you can discern modernity in that personally. It's based on a 17th century, what's called a gophering iron, uh, which, which would have been used to help uh, iron shirts, in fact. Uh, but it's a strange thing indeed. Um, and he was also big on mixed metal, which was one of the earlier, not the first by any means, but one of the earlier people to use silver and copper, which was not in the English tradition at all. Uh, I'll just say on those candlesticks, a good friend of mine described them as the, as the Mick Jagger of silver. That is to say, um, they seem really ugly, but actually everyone's very attracted to them. So it uh, amuses me, and I think there's something about that. So that's Oliver Baker. He was influential. He, he, he certainly produced um, items that were innovative, but in fact, it's the radical failure of his arts and crafts work for Hassler that um, is, makes him most influential, because there's this quote on the right, which is ex post, it's after, it's from 1975 when the son of um, William Hassler, Frank Hassler, recalled how people were laughing at these pieces, or his father explained how these pieces were laughed at and they couldn't sell them. And that led them to Liberty's door to try and sell them through Liberty. And Liberty took these designs and took these pieces. And that was one of the major contributing factors to the Cumric Liberty Range or Simric Liberty Range. And of course, as I'm about to come on to, that was a very, very um, influential range in itself. Um, as a smaller side, for those that like their pewter, you will see that the large bowl I've got there in silver and copper, that is actually a very well-known piece in pewter because Liberty's mass produced that in pewter. So you get a real sense of that connection between authentic arts and crafts and then uh, the more commercial Liberty, which I'm now, I'm now coming on to. So let me pause and say, so we've got three influences so far in terms of the quality of Gilbert Marx. We've got the enamels of Alexander Fisher. We've got, if you like, the radicalism and failure of um, Oliver Baker. And then you get Art Nouveau. Uh, Art Nouveau is the final piece of this puzzle, which says, how did we get this radical move from 1890s to 1900s uh, silver and modernism? So if you take what arts and crafts is, it's really a social movement. So I should pause. Arts and crafts on Art Nouveau are hugely different things. Art Nouveau was hugely rejected in Britain as a very funny, sexualized, continental thing, and yet it remained very influential. So just to talk about that, arts and crafts was a social movement. Art Nouveau was, was anything but. Uh, arts and crafts was all about a lack of ornamentation, austere, seeing the workmanship. Art Nouveau is hugely flamboyant with your curly hair, you know, maidens and so forth. Arts and crafts drew from a national historicist culture uh, of design. Art Nouveau was a fundamentally from Japan and borrowed from Japan and then with a European twist. And arts and crafts really cared about how something was made. So being hand manufactured was absolutely fundamental to something being arts and crafts. And in Art Nouveau, that's irrelevant. The method of manufacture is not a, a part of the thesis of the item at all. So you get this very different uh, culture, this very different design movement but it was very influential, despite being denied as being influential on the arts and crafts. And just to show that here, you have three pieces by some of the silversmiths I've spoken about or will speak about. So you've got Oliver Baker's piece on the left, which is very arts and crafts, but then you see that Art Nouveau frieze around it. You get Ashby in this vase, which is from 1899 also, and that has, um, uh, again, a frieze around the base, which is very Art Nouveau. And you have the Ramsden and Carr mirror on the right, which is uh, quite squir squirreling uh, design, maybe historicist as well, but certainly with the silver strap work down the edge, 
uh, touching on Art Nouveau. And just to show you, without knocking over any other pieces, this is the scale of that Oliver Baker bowl, which is uh, again one of the authentic Hassler pieces. And you see, you see silver rivets in copper. Um, so again, you see the copper and you know, all very hand hammered, incredibly uh, uh, hand hammered actually at such a heavy gauge. So very arts and crafts, but there in the design, you can see a frieze, uh, which could be straight out of, I'll say, Japan uh, or the Art Nouveau movement. And so you start to see around 1899, this influence. And I'll just wrap up on this section then to say, look, this is where you really start to see uh, modernity. And I've picked three pieces, um, which are all in major US museums. I thought that was appropriate. And you really start to see now how by 18, 19, 1899, 1900, when all of these were designed, uh, just how effective these um, component features were to creating this incredible, uh, incredible um, uh, period of silver. So you have this Charles Ashby cup. You can see the arts and crafts influence in the, in the silver wire work, I think. You can see the enamel clearly in the stone. So it's, it's modern, but it's also uh, uh, stunning and clearly still in the arts and crafts uh, period. Uh, even more modern, perhaps, is Kate Harris. I'll talk about her in a minute. You see this lamp, it dates to 1900. Uh, very squirling, very Art Nouveau around, around the, uh, the stem, but also very clean line, very modern. And then you get this Archibald Knox Liberty jug with its tailing handle, its squirling decorative pattern, Celtic decorative pattern. Uh, and again, it looks incredibly modern. So that is what we're going to talk about in the next section and demonstrate these silversmiths um, and designers who really created this phenomenal silver.